BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Hope everyone had a good weekend. Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we begin. The first one is that there is a new Zodiac Killer series that is available here on this channel called New Discovery, the Moraga Letters, which is coming out on the weekends. Saturday evenings is perhaps the best way to put it, although like the last episode, it came out in the early a.m. hours of Sunday, and this is talking about a new Zodiac Killer suspect named Robert Fulvins, as well as some pieces of writing that could possibly have been connected to the Zodiac Killer, hence the name the Moraga Letters. But the last episode talked about a possible solution to the map code. Once again, Zodiac Killer, New Discovery, the Moraga Letters, available here on BBO War. And the observations about the case that are used in that series are made by YouTube user uh, Sphere the Cube and I appreciate everything that he has done. Also, there is an ongoing series about the New Orleans Axeman, available here on this channel, which comes out on Wednesdays. The Axeman is another unsolved murder mystery from the early part of the 20th century, and of course there's always the Anything Goes Friday segments where any subject is fair game. And if you would like to support any of these efforts, there are a couple things that you can do. You can go over to Launchpad 1 and download the show for free, you can download the audio version as a pure podcast, and you can also go to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box. Anyone who makes a donation or contribution to help support the show will get a shout-out on Zodiac Mondays. One more time, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. The link is in the description box. So I would like to begin with some of the earlier events in Zodiac activity. First, the Zodiac committed a double murder in December of 1968, killing David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Then the Zodiac went silent and went cold for nearly seven months, and it wasn't until the July 4th, 1969 shooting of Darlene Farron and Mike Michaud that we would see the Zodiac again. Moreover, the Zodiac also made a phone call after the crime. I mean, approximately 30 minutes after the call was reported into 911. Darlene Farron may have been shot around 11.55 p.m. on July 4th of 1969. Then someone calls it in that there's these two people who have been shot at 12.10 a.m. And then Darlene Farron is pronounced dead at 12.38 a.m. And the first Zodiac killer phone call comes at 12.40 a.m. Next, the Zodiac or somebody writing this letter, would send in letters and ciphers to three newspapers, the San Francisco Examiner, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Vallejo Times Herald. And they each had a third of this cryptogram code, and it was accompanied by a letter, and I would like to read that now. Dear Editor, this is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas, spelled with two S's, at Lake Herman and the girl on the 4th of July near the golf course in Vallejo. To prove I killed them, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. Christmas. The brand of ammo was Super X. Ten shots were fired. The boy was on his back with his feet to the car, and the girl was on her right side, feet to the west. Fourth of July. 
The girl was wearing patterned slacks. The boy was also shot in the knee. The brand of ammo was Western. And then you're supposed to turn the page over, but as you see, someone is very deliberately trying to take credit for that murder. Of uh, those three murders, actually, as well as the attempted murder of Mike Najot, who survived the Blue Rock Springs shooting. But with the cipher, there is a very simple message that is in there. If you were to arrange the pieces of the cipher mailed to the three newspapers in a particular order, then you could use it, use a very simple substitution method to solve it, which was done by Don and Betty Hardin. And it reveals, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's even more fun than hunting wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. And it goes on for a while talking about when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and those whom I have killed will be my slaves. I will not give you my name because you'll slow down. It, um, he goes on for a while, just uh, rambling there off of memory. But the final line of text in the 408 cipher has not been uncoded. It is just a bizarre arrangement of letters, and there are 18 of them, and that re it's referred to as the Z18 code. In the first episode of Zodiac Killer New Discovery, the Moraga Letters, I talked about a possible way of solving the Z18 code that was proposed by Sphiri, which is that first you have to unscramble the letters, then you have to translate them from Pig Latin to English, it's like ipre, ipre, obitre, and the way that Pig Latin moves the syllables around. And the solution is the tip. Hi, I'm Robert. And um, I always leave out the step. First you uh, translate it from Pig Latin to English. Then you actually have to do a third step and rearrange the words in a particular way. So there are two moments of unscrambling, or two times when you need to unscramble the letters, or in, and actually unscramble the words, too. Unscramble, pig Latin, unscramble. That's a good way of looking at it. it. Almost sounds like breakfast, you know, anything about sausage or bacon. I must be hungry, but I'm going to digress from that. All right, so is this the correct method of solving the Z18 code? One of the benefits of doing the show on the Moraga letters is we could get feedback from other people and simply just get the other people's take on the subject. And there are two responses that I would like to read about the Z18. First one comes to us from Michael Cole, who is the author of the Zodiac Revisited Trilogy. And he says, Hey Ned, I listened to the episode. I don't think this is the Zodiac. This feels more like what I call non-disprovability, related to what other people claim to be confirmation bias. Basically, people get a suspect, find some coincidences, and realize they can't disprove that person is the Zodiac. Of course, it's impossible to disprove that many people were the Zodiac, and then conclude that that person is likely the Zodiac. I don't, don't see anything here that makes a compelling case that the person in question, that's Robert Bolvins, was the Zodiac. It's interesting that you mention the final 18 characters of the 408 cipher. As I argue in The Zodiac Revisited, Volume 2, the fact that the symbols were likely pulled down from elsewhere in their respective columns as discovered by Brax Sisko, makes a very strong case that there is no hidden message or meaning in those symbols, i.e. they are just filler. Hence, any suggested solution is almost certainly incorrect. Non-disapprovability, non-disapprovability, excuse me, is likely factoring into both the suggested 18-symbol solution and the proposed suspect. I'm not sure if you're going to like these comments or not, but nevertheless... They are there in my defense, you asked. And um, absolutely, I'm, I'm welcoming comments like that. Uh, the, the, yes, the ambition was to find out what other people were going to say about this new idea, this new suspect. And, of course, the new observations regarding the ciphers and anybody who is giving a response in, in an honest way is welcomed. Now, again... What do we say? Unscramble pig Latin, unscramble that that's a possible solution to the Z18 cipher, the Z18 code. The tip, hi, I'm Robert. A response from Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com. Hi, Ned. In terms of letters and writing that he, Sphiri, has provided, I would have to know their origin was genuine and not just manufactured. Without being able to ratify their authenticity as coming from Robert Bolvins, 
it's impossible to travel much beyond that. Assuming that Sphiri is being honest, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, I have never been a fan of handwriting analysis regarding the Zodiac Killer, as the comparison between the July 31, 1969 letters and communications such as the Melvin Belli letter shows how markedly different both handwriting samples are. Had the Belli letter been mailed in 1971 or 1986, or absent of a piece of the bloody shirt, nobody with any good conscience would be declaring it genuine. The only handwriting analysis that is of profound benefit is when it virtually mimics the wording, structure, and punctuation of previously unreleased letters or envelopes. Go to Tom Voigt's sites and convere, compare the Exorcist envelope, and then in 1974, the unreleased envelope, mailed on April 28th of 1970. This verifies the Exorcist letter. Other than techniques like this, I find handwriting analysis unreliable at best. I cannot say that Volvens isn't Zodiac, as with most suspects, simply because the evidence isn't strong enough. As I have stated before, the technique used by people, identifying suspects, is flawed. If it was a reliable approach, everybody should arrive at a consensus. Yet we have hundreds, if not thousands, of persons of interest, showing the versatility of looking through rose-tinted glasses. Regarding the unsolved 18 characters, the tip, Hi, I'm Robert, is 16 characters, it's clear that the Zodiac made a mistake when creating his 408 cipher text grid from his draft version because he clearly omitted the word people or missed the entire line from the 408 cipher. Therefore, his intention was to either leave 12 characters unsolved at the foot of his cipher or just one character. I believe the suggestion of a missing line by David Ornchak is the best answer I've heard. And um, so you can also see someone is challenging the solution to the Z18 code as well, disagreeing. But um, Sphiri, uh was aware of this. I did share this email with him, and he said that the 18 letters would be accurate in the Pig Latin solution. It tre, tre, obi tre, the tip, hi, I'm Robert, and then unscramble Pig Latin, unscramble. You would be left with um, this uh, solution in English. But the Pig Latin would have 18 letters in the code, so that wouldn't mean that it was off by anything. And I do, I do agree with Sphiri, but um, we have two people, Michael Cole and Richard Grinnell, who are saying something that is a lot more valuable, and that is that they don't think the Z18 has any particular meaning. And this has been um, proposed by other far-out theorists, such as Steve Hodell and Gary Stewart. They've been, they've said that they also think that the Z18 has no meaning. It's just either meant to keep you guessing until the end of time, a distraction, or, as Cole and Grinnell said, that it was a filler line, or maybe a mistake on the part of the cryptographer, and it was a genuine error, and that, or that something was omitted when it should have been, and then that threw off the placement, so then the only solution was to just simply fill it with symbols. I mean, it's it's possible. And remember, this is an unsolved case, and... I was really thinking that Siri's solution to the Z18 had a lot of credibility, and no matter what, no matter what, I think he put an honest effort into trying to solve it, and a lot of um, a lot of good thinking went into that, trying to use Pig Latin to solve the Z18, but perhaps Richard Grinnell and Michael Cole make a stronger case that the Z18 might have no precise meaning at all. Now I would like to give a shout-out to Dennis D., who shared something with me about the Zodiac Killer's August 4th, 1969 letter. And as you see, we're going in somewhat chronological order. I'm trying to do my best for this episode. Perhaps I should do that more often. But after the 408 cipher and the first letters are mailed at the end of July, July 31st, we then have the August 4th, 1969 letter, which says, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In order, in answer to your asking for more details about the good times I've had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was already rolled down. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leapt backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat and then the floor, 
in the back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires and racing engine, as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly, as to not draw attention to myself. The man who told the police that my car was brown was a negro, about forty to forty-five, rather shabbily dressed. I was at the phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cops when he was walking by. When I hung up, the damn something thing began to ring, and that drew his attention to me and my car. Last Christ Mass, again, that's Christmas, but spell Christ Mass. In that episode, the police were wondering as to how I could shoot and hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but imply this by saying that it was a well-lit night and I could see the silhouettes on the horizon. Bullshit. That area is surrounded by hills and trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice in the center of the beam of light, if you aim it at a wall or a ceiling, you will see a black or dark spot in the center of the circle of light, about three to six inches across. When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike exactly in the center of the black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them with, as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use gun sights. I was not happy to see that I didn't get front page coverage. And the issue that we're going to be talking about is the pencil flashlight taped to the gun barrel, also known as the barrel of a gun. And I also thought the original text said gun barrel, but I digress from that as well. So I said very clearly that I don't own guns and I don't go shooting. I am an Eagle Scout and I used to shoot guns with the Scouts, but I was the absolute worst shot on the troop. I'm not even joking. So Dennis D responded to me on Facebook and he sent in a video that he made taping a pencil flashlight to the gun barrel and to see if it would work or not, if you aim to the center of the light, will you be able to hit the target? And it looks pretty successful. Now, the only thing I'm noticing is that he didn't seem to be shooting. Or the, the bullets do not seem to land exactly where I thought they would, maybe a little bit lower. But for all intents and purposes, it seems like... This is a method that does seem to work. Um, someone else had also written into the channel saying that he's a raccoon hunter and that he uses this method, taping a small flashlight to the gun barrel so that you can just shoot in the center of the beam of light or the light cone and you will be able to hit your aim. And Dynasty also wanted to provide the info that this would be a rather deadly method from 20 to 25 feet away. Now, as far as the Zodiac Killer's comment about how there were these silhouettes, I believe that came from Les Lundblad Sr., one of the original investigators from Lake Herman Road, who said that he wouldn't have needed to have any lights because as Betty Lou Jensen were, were running away, he would have been able to see her body silhouetted against the night sky. But the Zodiac disputed that, or whoever was writing that letter. And it seems like it's quite possible that this thing about the flat, the pencil flashlight could be true. So a lot of these pieces of information are falling in together, or falling together. Maybe they're landing in place rather than falling together. Things might fall apart, but they're coming together in a way that really does suggest that there's just a single perpetrator. And maybe, maybe in some way we can work in a second person but it really does, does seem like a consistent narrative all involving one person, and that a lot of the info that the Zodiac could have shared in the early letters would have been accurate, and it's not all lies, like uh, the way we would think in the past, the way that I thought in the past, rather. Right now, I would like to move on to the next segment here on this channel, and or here on this show. The whole channel is going to stay where it is. But the next segment here on Zodiac Monday, and it's actually referring to something that I put out on the Friday show. I did an episode called The Life and Ideas of Shel Cavale. Shel Cavale is a Zodiac killer suspect, but he was a rather successful businessman, and he is the person discussed in Mike Rodelli's books In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, as well as the electronic version, The Hunt for Zodiac. 
which I have a book discussion about here on this channel. It's actually worked into one of the Zodiac Monday episodes, like the Zodiac News Report plus The Hunt for Zodiac. And there's another book about Shel Cavale called Lunches with Mr. Q by Kevin Nelson. And I was really responding to the material that has been mentioned in that book because, as I said, Shel Cavale was a very successful businessman in not only the auto business but also the banking sector, as discussed by Nelson in the book. And I got a response from Mike Rodelli, which I asked him to. I asked him if he would give a comment on my episode, because Mike Rodelli literally wrote the book on Shoal Cavale being a Zodiac killer suspect. And he said, I have a few thoughts about this book and Ned's presentation. I come over some of these points in my own book, In the Shadow of Mount Diablo. First of all, when a reporter writes an article, he has to balance it. This book is such a one-sided view of Shel Cavale that I believe, but cannot prove, that it was commissioned by him. Sort of like an autobiography written by another person. There's very little mention of anything that makes him sound like the Zodiac Killer, or sound sociopathic. There's no mention of his lifelong aloofness, which was a very prominent feature of his personality that matches with what people have said about the Zodiac for many years. The author mentions how Cavale made a lot of money in banking, but doesn't talk about how he made that money or the two consent decrees he had to he had to sign. There's even a little spot where Cavale gets to talk about his distaste for murder. I think Ned fell into the trap that this book was intended to set, and that is painting Cavale as this very nice, if tough, businessman. Cavale was the only credible person in 1947 to say that flying saucers were from outer space. Of course, you don't see that mentioned in the book. It talks about him learning to play piano, but it doesn't talk about his friend telling me in 2006 that his mind had begun to wander. If you have dementia, that's presumably progressive, how do you learn to play the piano in 2009, some three years after your mind started to go downhill? I believe that the stuff in the book about the stuff about the mind wandering was told to me during our face-to-face -face meeting in order to create plausible deniability for all the lies Cavale told me that day, including the fact that he didn't pay much attention to his Norse roots, and that were, but in the book, they are discussed, and he's having Norse-themed parties with original Norwegian outfits at his house. I forget if the author mentions that Cavale opened a comedy club in 2010, but I'm sure it doesn't mention that there was a Dr. Z working the audience as a comedian that night. Sometimes it's not what you're reading in the book that's important, but what you don't read or are not permitted to know. And no matter what, thank you so much to Mike Rodelli for that response. But as you see, very extensive here. So let's uh, go through some of this piece by piece. The book Lunches with Mr. Q is written by Kevin Nelson, and he is a writer who has covered numerous other subjects. I googled him when I had purchased the book, and Yes, he has books out on all kinds of different things. I have no idea if Cavale commissioned the book or not, but I said a lot of this, though, in my book discussion, and I will reiterate some of it. But firstly, to say that it presents a one-sided view of Shel Cavale, that was one of the points that I did share in that direct video when I said... It starts out very light and fluffy, and it's saying all these wonderful things about Mr. Q and how he's so smart and how he's so successful. But it does point out that he wasn't always a successful businessman. Firstly, he had a business venture that completely failed trying to launch his own automobile, the Cavale Mangusta, which is the Italian word for mongoose. And I found that that was just a very humanizing, down-to-earth moment when it showed, okay, they've said all of these giant fluffy things about Cavale, now he makes mistakes too. Not everything he does is perfect. So the book starts out that way, but it does highlight some of his flaws. As far as, um, it, there's nothing in the book that makes him sound like the Zodiac Killer or sound sociopathic, this is the real reason why I wanted to respond to it here on the Zodiac Killer news report, was because my ultimate conclusion from reading the book was that do I think that Shel Cavale was a sociopath? No. Do I think that he had sociopathic tendencies? Yes. Did that book also encourage me to think that Shel Cavale had sociopathic tendencies? 
Also, yes. Did I say that in the episode where I got called out for not saying it? Also, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, these things were all discussed very clearly in my um, discussion on Shel Cavale. And even even if it wasn't completely clear in that episode, I'm saying it right now. I, I do think the book makes it look like Shel Cavale had sociopathic tendencies, that he was someone who was not only a risk taker, but also a problem solver and showing a lot of indifference to other people and indifference to how his business decisions would have affected other people. Secondarily, he, there's also this um, paragraph when he just talks about how he looks down on people who are less intelligent than him. And it says the exact line, people who have book smarts without street smarts are two times smart and three times stupid. And that Cavale was frequently known to say synonymous statements about how other people are stupid. He did this very frequently. And um, again, that is also something that, even though it's a mean thing to say, I, th I thought that, okay, great, I'm glad this book isn't completely one-sided. Now, to give credit to Mike Rodelli and his comment, is the book mostly one-sided? Oh, yes, the majority of it is. The majority of it really just puffs up Cavale as this um, great entrepreneur and rags-to-riches story. But then... The um, other point, though, where I'll, I'll give credit to Rodelli, is that talking about his aloofness, and um, no, I didn't say anything about that in the episode, and no, the book really didn't talk about how he had an aloof, quirky personality. All right, so I will, I will give him those points, and, and I do mean that in all honesty. I do strongly disagree with the statement that if you read the book Lunches with Mr. Q., that it doesn't make Cavale sound a little bit sociopathic. I mean, I think that it does, and that's just me. And you can hear my extended um, ramblings about that particular book, as well as some outside sources in the episode The Life and Ideas of Shel Cavale, available here on this channel. Now, there is something here at the end of the comment, though, where it says, I'm sure it doesn't mention that there was a Dr. Z working the audience as a comedian that night, but sometimes, oh yes, that Dr. Z is perhaps um, a reference to Charlie Chan at Treasure Island, which has a character named Dr. Zodiac, and there's a very big kind of um, auditorium scene, theater scene, I think is the best way to put it. Not exactly a conventional nightclub, but it's like in a theater, and Dr. Zodiac is someone whom, well, we have to find out what's going on in that mystery. And I've discussed that recently here on one of the Zodiac News Reports, but that could be a direct reference to an influence on the Zodiac Killer. I absolutely believe that Charlie Chan at Treasure Island was an influence on the Zodiac Killer's um, persona. But there's another part here that I do agree with, and it says that Shel Cavale didn't pay attention to his Norse roots, where in the book he talks about having thrown Norse theme parties complete with original Norwegian outfits at his house. Yeah, I think Shulka Vale was very in touch with his Norse roots. If you go over to Tom Voigt's channel, he even talks about, you know, in his elder years, he's telling the story about how he was growing up in Norway and he loved the horses there. And um, I, th I, th I, believe, I side with Rodelli on that one, that he would have been in touch with his North, Norse roots. So, I mean, that's just my take on the subject. As you see, some agreements and some disagreements. And the next comment in question we have is from Brian H., who sent this into the email address, or the Facebook page, rather. Anybody can write the show at my personal Facebook, which is in the description box. There's also a Facebook page for Black Box Online Radio, and you can also keep in touch via email. That's the best way if you want to send, like, extended responses, blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. And this message from Brian H. says, Good afternoon. I had a chance to listen to a lot of your stuff on Black Box Online Radio. I really like it. I was wondering if you have anything on Gary Post. I understand you're not a fan of him being the Zodiac, but I was wondering if you have anything on why you think he is not. Okay, Gary Francis Post is a suspect that has been out for a while. I mean, this he was not the newest suspect in the world. However, he truly became a big topic of discussion in the fall of 2021 
when a group called the Case Breakers issued a press release saying that they had solved the Zodiac Killer mystery and identified him as Gary Francis Post, and media outlets such as TMZ and Fox News took the story and they ran with it and then they started spreading media wildfires about how the Zodiac Killer mystery had been solved, and it turned into a bunch of clickbait on how investigators say that the Zodiac Killer mystery has been solved, but then, once you actually read the headlines of the article and go into the text of it, it says independent investigators, just simply meaning that this group called the Case Breakers says that they have solved the mystery. He is just their suspect. So even um, some things that have nothing to do with Gary Post as the Zodiac are involving the media, and it goes to show you that maybe the media players such as Fox, TMZ, and some of the smaller newspapers out there fudged the facts just to get clicks and views. There's a difference between a group of independent investigators and actually coming from law enforcement. The next point, which I think is more pressing, is that the case breakers did not do a good job of presenting their findings. They did not show any form of compelling evidence. They simply pointed to some lines on Gary Post's forehead and said that that he had scars that matched the lines that were drawn on the Zodiac Killer composite sketch. Firstly, almost certainly, the lines on the Zodiac Killer composite sketch were, were drawn to show age and to be filler, so it wasn't a giant blank space when someone was looking at it. Absolutely not intended to be scars on the forehead. I mean... I think that that is rather clear. The second one is they chose to compare a human being to a cartoon illustration of the Zodiac and saying that, hey, look how these two images are similar. One is Gary Post and another was a cartoon drawn by Robert Graysmith, not the composite sketch. But firstly, the 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 drawing of the Zodiac is in the Lake Berryessa costume. You can't even see any facial similarities and they think that it's similar to Post's body type, Graysmith was not a witness to the Lake Berryessa stabbing. And to expand upon some things that I didn't cover in my first episode about Gary Post as a Zodiac suspect, there is a writer out there named Dale Julin, who is also a broadcaster, and he followed the Zodiac case rather closely for about seven years and assembled his findings about Gary Francis Post into a book, which I believe is called Catching Zodiac, which should be coming out sometime this year. And he proposed several solutions to the Zodiac Killer's cards, particularly the Peek Through the Pines card, the Halloween card, and the 13-Hole Punch card. I did a rather extensive um, analytical response to his Halloween card episode, or to his Halloween card theory, and he believes that there are very long messages that are contained in the artwork on these greeting cards. And Dale Julin centers his Zodiac theory on the disappearance of Donna Lass. And number one, Donna Lass is not a confirmed Zodiac killer victim. And the reason why they think Gary Post murdered Donna Lass is because he made a simple comment, I put a she in a tree. And I think he made this in reference to Lake Tahoe and Donna Lass disappeared from State Line, Nevada, which is on the shores of Lake Tahoe. I mean, that's not a substantial connection. Very, very general statements, very flimsy evidence, and it's almost even just blatant misrepresentations of small pieces of of, of, of facts. Like, they're just taking, like, half a fact, and then they're trying to connect it to another half fact, and they're not doing a very articulate job of that. But... To Dale Julin's credit, he can talk about the facts of the of the Zodiac case, whereas some members of the case breakers, such as Tom Colbert, their leader, cannot, and we saw that on the Megyn Kelly episode that he did where he was featured, and I did a full response to that one available here on this channel. But with Dale Julin's solutions to, like, say, the Halloween card, it begins with Bye Bye Birdie, Time to Fly, and talking about Nurse Donna Lass, and then the final line of it says... On the Hooten Tootin MS Dixie ship, I I Captain Gary Francis Post. And somebody, one of you guys in the comments section wrote in saying, even if some way somehow it turns out that Gary Francis Post was the Zodiac killer, then I think these solutions to the greeting cards are probably 
coincidental. Because I have to be very honest with you, I do not believe that the Halloween card or the Peek Through the Pines card have hidden messages to that particular level. Maybe something about connecting a particular shape or this was an inspiration for this symbol. But Dale Julen looks at these cards and he extracts probably three or four paragraphs of text. And a lot of it talks about the disappearance of Donna Lass. And I did a multi-part series on Donna Lass last year, so I'm very curious what other people think about her case. And it, those are the things, though, that I think are much more defendable and much easier to present. And if I have to be very frank with you, I think Tom Colbert, who is the leader of this Case Breakers organization, is an absolute fraud, an absolute liar, possibly a grifter. Maybe he's just really bad at telling stories or something like that. But when he presented this on the Megyn Kelly show, he didn't even have a basic understanding of the facts of the Zodiac mystery. And he openly had to ask Megyn Kelly, which city did the first crime occur in? And like she's like, well, let's talk about the first Zodiac killer crime. And he says, which city was that? And um, I don't even believe it was in a city. It was in, on unincorporated land between Benicia and Vallejo in California. But let's um, get away from that for a second. The point is, Dale Julin is much more articulate on the facts of the case, and he is the one who has actually provided a lot of the analysis about Gary Francis Post, but I think that his material is too intricate for its own good. And uh, the, the other point that I brought up in the past about why I thought his Halloween card solution was incredible on the Hooten Tootin MS Dixie ship by I Captain Gary Francis Post, the MS Dixie is a paddle wheel boat that was taken from the Mississippi River and brought to South Lake Tahoe. And the MS Dixie did operate on Lake Tahoe, but it wasn't operational until 1972. It was docked on Lake Tahoe, but not operational. So I think that it um, was perhaps just a fluke that Dale Julin Got, like, Dale Julen got lucky with his solution. He probably didn't know that the boat wasn't operational at the time. That this um, rebuilt Mississippi paddle wheeler was on the lake, but it wasn't operational. So why call it the Hooten Tootin MS Dixie ship if it's not even working at the time? And there's actually now an MS Dixie 2 that is working on Lake Tahoe. And I've covered this in some of the previous Zodiac News reports, which I think you can find rather easily if you'd like to hear an extended version. But it doesn't quite make sense. His solutions, I think, are going to be so complex that it's almost as if he is looking at a set of true facts. Again, these aren't the half facts. These are the real facts. The images on the Halloween card. And he's trying to tell a story in his own creative way based on those images. But I do not find his solutions to be very credible because it's most likely that he's just making it up in his own mistaken way. So those are the reasons why I don't think Gary Francis Post was the Zodiac. And again, being clear, I'm not calling Dale Julen a fraud. Absolutely not. I mean... I think Tom Colbert is a fraud, and I don't even know Dale Julen's exact relationship with the case breakers, if he is an honorary member or full member. But sometimes in the true crime world, somebody comes up with an idea, and then it gets exploited by snake oil salesman B, where it's like, oh yeah, hey, you know, you, you got some really good stuff. I'm just, I'm going to market it for you, and I'm going to share it to the world for you. And that's kind of what I think is going on. Because, well, let's be frank, lots of people propose suspects. Lots of people propose new Zodiac theories. I'm even doing a regular weekend segment about somebody's new Zodiac theory. But the, the point is that you can have different ideas. That's fine. But if they're going to present evidence, they need to present credible evidence. And they haven't done so with Gary Francis Post as a suspect. All I see is that this guy was a house painter from California. He was not the nicest person in the world, arrested for domestic violence. He was someone who was a rather passionate hunter, which many people are, and he even 
if these stories about him are true, he liked to hunt bears, and like he would go on these kill trips into the mountains, right? Yeah, that's called a hunting trip. Yeah, he's going hunting. Kill trips in the mountains. Yeah, he's killing something. Not necessarily killing people. But let's look at some of these other points from the case breakers. That Gary Post buried the guns that were used in the Zodiac Killer shootings, yet they did not present them. That Donna Lass was hanged from a tree in California, or in the, in the Lake Tahoe region, pardon, si me excuse. And they found the tree, but they didn't find any physical evidence. So all of their stories are not being substantiated. And the only ones that are, are little pieces of hearsay. Oh, yeah, yeah, God, 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 Gary Posty, he told me that he was Zodiac back when we was locked up in the joint. When are you going to give me my McDonald's sandwich? Yeah, I did what you told me to, gosh darn it. Yeah, they got stuff like that. That does not mean that they have any of the hard evidence. If he had actually buried the guns and they knew where they were, then that would be something. They also said that he carved out messages from the Halloween card into a tree, and then it just looks like a bunch of blurry bark. I I don't think these people have any credibility. And if Dale Julian had actually wanted to make a better name for himself, he probably should have stayed away from them. Again, I don't know his real reaction. I've never talked to him. I've just seen him interviewed once on YouTube, as well as read several articles about him. And the South... Uh, the um, Lake Tahoe uh, Daily Tribune did a very extensive article on Dale Julian's solutions to the Halloween card and the Peek Through the Pines card and the 13 Hole Punch card. And I've done responses to the 13. <laughs> wow, I messed that up. I've done responses to the Halloween card and the Pines card, but I have not really covered the 13 Hole Punch card here on this channel, but I will do so in the very near future. So. That's going to be it for me in this episode. What do you think about Gary Francis Post as a Zodiac Killer suspect? What do you think about the solution to the Z18 code? What do you think about Shell Cavale as not only a Zodiac Killer suspect, but also as a sociopath? You can put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always BlackboxNed88 over on Instagram. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.